Let's give it a few minutes for people to join here. So welcome everyone. People are just populating through the link. So we'll just take one minute to, to let everyone in before we start. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Jessica Collins and I am the Executive Director of the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. Um, and we are so very pleased and grateful to have all of you joining with us for this incredibly important webinar on long COVID. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Rep. Mindy Dom for encouraging us at the Public Health Institute uh, to cover this important topic uh, and for introducing us to this esteemed panel, which we're uh, very eager to hear from. And we're just very grateful for everyone to have joined us. Um, a couple of housekeeping. If you have technical difficulties or need help with anything over the next hour, please send a direct chat to one of the hosts. Uh, we are recording this webinar. The recording will be emailed to registrants and posted on our Public Health Institute of Western Mass website. When the webinar ends, we would ask that you take just a please take a few minutes, not even a few minutes, but a few moments to complete a short survey. Uh, about your webinar experience, um, and we will share the link at the end. So if you wouldn't mind sticking around to do that, we would uh, very much uh, appreciate that. Um, and now I would like to hand it over to Rep. Mindy Dom, our dear friend and colleague um, who has shared her leadership and her wisdom and um, her dedication uh, to issues like long COVID and, and public health issues uh, long before this. So. Um, she will share her opening thoughts and then introduce our speakers. So thank rest you. On. Thank you. So first, I just really want to say thank you to the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. It really doesn't take encouraging um, to have you do these webinars. You've demonstrated leadership repeatedly on the commitment to make sure that information gets out to the public on COVID and on other issues. And so I want to thank you for hosting and for pulling us all together. Um, I just want to briefly say my interest in this webinar was sparked by constituents. Um, in about a four-day period, my office was contacted by about four different constituents, each of whom had a long COVID experience, each of whom was looking for information, access to resources, services, and knowledgeable providers, and each sort of coming up to a brick wall. And so that sort of indicated to me that long COVID, not only was COVID still with us, but long COVID was with us, and we needed to start doing some education and information sharing um, as quickly as possible. And it reminded me a lot of the beginning of the HIV epidemic when I was involved. And we didn't know a lot. We didn't know a lot about treatment. We didn't know a lot about services, but we needed to find out and we needed to listen to the people who were living with it. And so I wanna thank the experts who are here with us today. We're gonna to learn so much and it's so valuable. But I also wanna thank the experts who are in the audience who are living with long COVID and encourage you to continue to reach out to providers, your legislators, um, your friends, your neighbors for support. That's how we learn what you need. And um, you are the experts right now in terms of what it's like to live with long COVID in Massachusetts and what we need to do in government to make life better for you. So I also wanna encourage people to fill out that survey because as you can see, the Public Health Institute is incredibly responsive and receptive to doing um, webinars. And if you have ideas on what you want, I'm sure there's a place on that survey for you to touch base with them and let them know. So without further ado, Jessica, I'm gonna give it back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and to our experts. And I'm really looking forward to learning more. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Rep. Dom. So I would now like to um, introduce Dr. Bruce Levy, um, who has been leading um, really innovative and cutting edge work in long COVID um, at Mass General Hospital. He has a presentation for us, um, which I know we are all very eager to hear and learn from what he and his team have been learning. So I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much, uh, Jess, and thank you so much to Rep. Dom and to everyone involved in the uh, Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts. It's a real honor 
to be with you um, on this webinar and to share the podium with uh, Linda, who I, I know you're going to just be thrilled to hear from, and certainly Repnom uh, and those of you in the Public Health Institute. Um, so I, I'm going to say a few words about long COVID, and um, uh, and then there'll be plenty of time for a question and answer um, for those specific questions. So I would encourage you to utilize the, the Q&A portion of the, the webinar for any questions you'd like addressed. Um, I do have a few disclosures, not really related to long COVID, but just for the sake of transparency, related to some equity holdings and some consulting work that I've been asked to do. I'm the interim chair of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the chief of pulmonary critical care medicine. So I've been a frontline provider uh, for COVID and I have helped to found our COVID recovery center at the Brigham. So now long COVID as well. I wanna tell you about one of our patients to kind of frame the discussion. Um, this is Sarah who hails from Western Mass and came to see us in clinic. Uh, financial, she's a financial analyst. Um, I've changed some of the details here just so that there's no identifying, perfect identifying information, but very active um, in her uh, late 20s, early 30s. Um, uh, exercises every week and usually about four or five times a week. In uh, the Delta wave in early 2021, she uh, contracted acute COVID and um, uh, it really kind of rocked her world. Uh, she was she had a very severe flu-like illness. Um, thankfully, did not need to be hospitalized. Uh, so she was home for her entire illness. And then she was really kind of slow to recover. And she went to see providers um, and they weren't sure what was going on. You'll get over it, it's fine, no worries. And um, uh, a friend of hers was a nurse who um, had worked per diem at the Brigham and suggested that she come see us. Now, six months after um, her initial illness. At that time, uh, she was not really able to work. She was sleeping a good portion of the day, had significant host exertional malaise, um, uh, had just kind of started to, to do a little bit of part-time work, but her, her life, she hasn't exercised at all. Her life was really torn apart by this. Um, so uh, she, I, I'll come back to her, but she had an extensive evaluation to make sure nothing else was going on and we could not find any other explanation for her symptoms. And at the time now, six months after her acute illness, all testing for acute COVID was negative. So we're gonna talk about long COVID, but I think we have to spend at least a moment or two on COVID, acute COVID, because um, we've learned a lot about it and we've had to understand it to begin to understand how to deal with long COVID. Um, this is of course a coronavirus that is similar to the common cold viruses that are out there. And um, uh, yet this caused much more severe illness. And there has been coronaviruses that have done this before, um, but not to this extent and not in North America, um, interestingly. But um, uh, of course now we, as we understood the biology uh, of uh, the infection, there was this tremendous effort to generate vaccines, intravenous medicines for our hospitalized patients, and now oral antiviral medications. And in some cases, we learned that this, this infection led to blood clots that required therapeutic blood thinning with anticoagulants. So there was an incredible effort, including a public health effort, to really address um, the challenge of COVID, this new infection, and um, its treatment. Well, long COVID can be thought of as the post-pandemic pandemic. I'm not sure we're really post-pandemic, but it is now front and center. And uh, of course, we really need a similar public health approach to really fully understand and address um, long COVID. So PASC, you'll see this term used as well post-acute sequelae of COVID. Um, this, of course, was known even early in 2020 in the lay press, 
Um, and uh, there's been much written about long COVID and we'll talk about it in more detail today. So here it is, the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. That's the NIH term for this. Uh, long COVID is the more common term. In the UK, it's often called long hauler COVID. So you may hear of that term as well. Um, the symptoms uh, predominantly are represented here, fatigue being a major one and post-exertional malaise, muscle weakness, joint pain. There's a lot of neurocognitive uh, symptoms, often termed brain fog, trouble remembering things, stringing thoughts together, logic streams, and some frequent headaches, significant mental health challenges with increased anxiety and depression. And some people have had some pretty substantial impact in terms of smell and taste with long-term loss of those senses, which can be, of course, very disruptive. This is the most prominent symptoms, but this is just an example of how broad the symptom complex can be in this condition. Uh, everything from dysautonomia to hair loss to cardiac and GI symptoms and respiratory symptoms and sleep disturbances. So this is a new illness with new constellations of symptoms that all seem to be attributable to that initial infection with COVID that are durable beyond at least 30 days after infection. We've learned that long COVID is more common in women than men, at least two to one, and many studies show about a three to one ratio. Of course, both are affected. And in general, this has been a challenging uh, entity clinically to address because a lot of the proposed care that's been raised for uh, uh, people with symptoms of long COVID is to exclude other uh, medical conditions. And the proposed care is quite costly and not easily accessible in many parts of the Commonwealth. So you can see some of on this, summary illustration, some of what's been proposed, six minute walk tests, different types of sophisticated chest imaging, um, uh, tilt table testing and uh, testing for dysautonomia, um, uh, uh, extensive renal uh, testing. These types of things are expensive and not uniformly available. At the Brigham in March of 2021, we launched uh, what we termed the COVID Recovery Center. And um, this is an example of about a year in, we had about 1300 patients that had been seen their new patients. Now actually we're up to 25, over 2,500. We get about 100 to 150 a month on average new patients coming in for care. So you can see that this is truly a prominent uh, um, health crisis. These are just, using some hierarchical clustering, a statistical technique to just say, to tell us about these patients that are coming in to see us. This is 1300, it's unpublished. And what broke out in the people coming to this clinic are three clusters of individuals, cluster one, two, and three. Cluster one seemed to have a, a larger proportion of folks who are Latinx, who were, um, uh, needing to utilize interpreter services. Uh, they have government insurance and have had an experience of an ICU admission, intensive care unit admission. Cluster two were people that were generally white and covered by commercial insurance and had the lowest ICU admission rate. And the third cluster were more likely to be African-American and uh, to, to have commercial uh, insurance. And if you compared the cluster two, so the, the folks who were predominantly white to those who were either Latinx in this first comparison uh, or, or African-American in the second comparison, um, what you can see here is that when you compare cluster two to cluster one, patients as mentioned have higher rates, about almost fourfold rate of ICU admission. The symptom complex is much more common and, and um, uh, infects, uh, affects many of the systems that I mentioned. And you can see the, um, that there was a, uh, a, a real need for mental health uh, education. 
in terms of cluster three relative to cluster two, um, there were uh, some fewer reports of some of the neurocognitive symptoms, interestingly, um, and some increased use of uh, community need for use of, of uh, community services and navigating government benefits. Clinically, um, in the face of this new challenge, new illness, um, we reached across the region in Eastern Massachusetts in the Boston area and developed what we call the Greater Boston COVID-19 Recovery Cohort so that we could share clinical information and actually combine together collaboratively to do important research in this area. And I was the lead at the Brigham, but you can see my colleagues here at the academic um, health centers that are, that are listed. But we also reached out to the community and have worked with community partners and formed a community partnership table in which we're trying to be informed by community needs. And the goal is to bring education uh, to the communities uh, and also to incorporate those in the community that would like to participate in the research enterprise to better understand long COVID. So together we competed and were successful in, in being incorporated into a National Institutes of Health study across the nation of long COVID. It's called Recover for short, researching COVID to enhance recovery. And we're one of 17 consortia across the nation that are in the doing the important work now of trying to better understand long COVID and identify disease driving mechanisms. Specifically, we've been most active in the adult cohort. There are members of our community that are involved in some of the other cohorts as well, um, but uh, principally we've been largely involved in the adult cohort. Let me just return to our patient. Um, so our patient, Sarah, um, was given a prescription really of non-medicinal therapies, importantly incorporating rehab in uh, mental health, uh, um, was addressed and um, other physical um, uh, remedies to that emphasize rehab, diet, nutrition, sleep, uh, regular um, uh, increasing on, under guidance of her uh, activities. And she slowly did start to improve, but it took her about a year to get better. And it took her another six months, saw her just recently, and she's now back exercising. She's back to work full time now. She's back exercising and uh, not quite to the same extent as before, but she is starting uh, to improve, for example, her times and her runs and things like this. Um, we had no medicinal therapy to offer her because right now we don't know, there's no evidence that any medicinal therapy is effective yet in long COVID. So it's left us with a lot of questions. Um, I'll take the last couple minutes to just emphasize this. The case definition for long COVID, what are the disease driving mechanisms? Is what's caused by the virus itself versus those who have severe illness? Who is at greatest risk? What's the right care? What's the prognosis? We have a lot of challenges in front of us in our research project. And as mentioned, this is really a public health crisis. Of a million people, maybe more, forced out of the labor force at any time, one time given due to uh, long COVID. Um, they're often young, people working in service industries very frequently are affected. Lots of economic vulnerability, as you might imagine, and healthcare costs are of course impacted because of all of the care that uh, these patients require. Equity, we've, it's important that we keep at the center of all that we do. And we know that vulnerable populations uh, were drastically impacted by acute COVID. And it's our sense um, that they're similarly impacted by long COVID. And unfortunately, we lost one of the world's great humanitarians, Paul Farmer, in this last year, shown here, a good, a good close friend. And he, of course, would always remind us to be sure that we keep equity at the center of all we do, and certainly COVID recovery. And what I'd like to do is end my remarks there and turn it back over to Jess. And thank you again for being here. 
I want to acknowledge folks in the COVID Recovery Center at the Brigham for some help with the slides, and um, Elizabeth Gay in particular for the cluster analysis I shared. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Levy. And I want to also acknowledge that I said that you were from the wrong hospital, so I'm sorry. I didn't have your bio right in front of me, but I am just going to take a quick moment to read um, your bio and then introduce our next speaker appropriately. So thank you, Dr. Bruce Levy. He's the interim chair of Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Parker B. Francis Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He serves as the medical director of the BWH Lung Center, where he sees patients in clinic and the medical intensive care unit, as he's just described. And he is also in the incoming director of the Bergen Research Institute. So thank you so much, Dr. Levy. And I apologize for getting that wrong. Um, Linda, so thrilled to have Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez is associate professor and former chair of the macro department at the Boston University School of Social Work. She is also the co-director of the BU Clinical Translation Science Institute Community Engagement Program. Her research focuses on advancing equity and it centers participatory and action research approaches to improve living environments and health. So I think this will be a very complimentary presentation to how uh, Dr. Levy um, uh, ended his. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much um, for having me today. I'm really excited um, to share some of our findings with you. Um, it's going to bring up my slides. Great. So I'm going to talk about long COVID impacts on diverse communities in Massachusetts, specifically um, Black and Latinx communities. I'll, I'm here today um, with Naharika Sharma, who um, works closely and um, manages and directs our projects related to long COVID. Um, I, do, I will start by acknowledging that we're a big team of people. No one can really do this work alone. I'm not a physician. Um, I'm coming to you from the School of Social Work and I do work around social welfare policy. So um, my colleagues, Janice John from Cambridge Health Alliance, um, Archipelago Strategies Group, Josiah Martinez and Angela Lima, and their whole team who has really worked with us around outreach and is gonna work with us around a marketing strategy to increase awareness of long COVID. Cheryl at the Brigham and um, Ingrid, and as well as Linda Hudson at Tufts and, um, and my colleagues from BUBMC, Rebecca and, and Tracy. Um, we come together regularly to put this project together. Um, and we also collaborate with the table that um, Bruce mentioned. So um, we're a big team. Um, and in terms of our, and we're funded by Mass CPR. And so our goal, as a, as a group was really to identify the impact of long COVID on diverse communities in Massachusetts, um, really thinking about barriers to long COVID treatment. What are they? Um, and then to increase awareness of long COVID, um, as well as identify resources in the community, um, as well as providers, uh, the providers that are, are serving the community, and then to influence policy. So um, we are really excited to be here today because we think there, there's a lot of space for policy um, in this area. Um, there are gaps in policies in this area, and we think that they need to be filled. Um, in our our current scope, we focus on diverse Black and Latinx communities because um, we have it's a small grant that we have, and that's where we had the most strengths as a team to be able to reach out. But we do want to acknowledge um, that the communities of color in Massachusetts are diverse, and we really need to be thinking about um, broadening the scope to hear from more communities and how long COVID is impacting them. Um, we started out by just doing some assessment. So we started out um, back in March before we were funded. We said, well, what's out there? What's the long COVID landscape uh, when it comes to treatment resources? And we did an, an internet search. We, we looked for different um, resources around long COVID. Um, and we, we then kind of mapped them out to see how they would look across the state. Um, not by not surprising, most of the long COVID clinics we identified were clustered. They were all clustered in Boston. We thought we found one in Concord. That's why you kind of see that plus sign on the map that's a little further out. But when we called, it was a rehabilitation center. So it wasn't um, a healthcare delivery site. Um, all of the dots are healthcare delivery site and you sites. And you can see that there's inequities, geographic inequities in terms of the resource distribution. Um, 
We then um, conducted interviews with the directors of the long COVID clinics. Naharka met with all of them for 30 to 45 minutes um, and really talked to them a little bit about um, their clinics. We did not, um, what you don't see on this map because it wasn't up and running at the time is um, children's. There was, um, they have a, a clinic that we didn't include. Um, we had only found the five adult, we only talked to the five adult sites because we were focusing on adult care. Um, so we spoke with all of them um, to learn a little bit more. And some of the quick themes, I wanna spend less time on this and more time about our conversations with residents. Um, some of the quick themes that we had is that um, they, the capacity of the clinics, many of them don't have the administrative capacity to track information related to patient demographics. Um, many of the impetus for the clinics coming up were really providers that were concerned about it. They saw a need and they organized and started to um, provide care. Um, those that we spoke to estimated that seven 70 to 90% of their patients were white and that also the majority of their patients were speaking English as their primary language. Um, only a small percent had listed Spanish. Um, also, the majority of patients at the academic medical centers had um, private insurance and the mean ages were between 40 and 60. And that's what we heard um, qualitatively from, from, um, from the clinics when we spoke with them. Um, only one program had... Um, an emphasis on long COVID follow-up through primary care providers. All of the other programs had limited contact with PCPs or primary care providers. Most programs could only see patients for one or two visits, excluding the intake. And all of the program directors we spoke with emphasized um, the importance of having social workers to support patients um, with resource navigation and mental health challenges. Um, and one of the programs we spoke with did use this um, they had another grant that they were working with and they had a community health worker pro, um, that was involved that allowed them to bring more people in. And so we saw that was um, an asset for that program. Um, so in terms of our, our what the data that I really want to focus on today um, is our long COVID impact assessment. So our goal was to explore the impact of long COVID on diverse communities across Massachusetts. So really thinking about areas that were hit hard um, during, I mean, most parts of the state were hit hard, um, but those that were had disproportionately, disproportionately high, um, high cases of COVID. Um, in the pandemic, we, we did, we wanted to have focus groups um, to talk to people who were living with um, symptoms of COVID that they've had for more than 30 days. Um, the word long COVID does not um, it translate well. In Spanish, we were calling it COVID prolongada, but there's not um, necessarily a word for it. So we wanted to, we talked about symptoms that persist um, for more than 30 days. Um, we had focus groups with eight to 10 people in the group and, and those people, the people in the groups, they themselves had COVID or they had a family member with um, COVID symptoms that persisted for longer than 30 days. Um, so we partnered, our marketing partner, ASG, we worked with them very closely. Um, we put out ads, we went on local radio um, and our goal was to recruit um, diverse Black and Latinx individuals. We ran groups um, in Spanish, um, Haitian Creole, um, English, and also Portuguese. And um, we had the capacity to run them in Cape Verdean Creole, but um, individuals we identified um, as Cape Verdean um, were English speaking. So um, that we, and it was a convenient sample um, that we used. So we wanted to find people who were available to participate in the groups. Um, all of our groups were recorded um, and they were conducted in, in we had um, six, in, six in Spanish, two in English, um, one in Portuguese and two in um, Haitian Creole. Um, all of the groups were recorded um, and then the transcripts were created in language and then they were translated and we applied a thematic analysis which involves merging yourself in the data, identifying patterns, um, in the data, developing codes, and then applying those codes and refining themes. Um, and then we met as a group um, with that group of folks I showed you at the beginning to identify larger themes within the data. And now we're kind of in the phase where we're sharing the data back. So you're the second, or you're the first group that's not part of our group to hear the data. Um, and we're excited to share it with you today. And we haven't yet published it. We're preparing a manuscript now. Um, of with the data, but we think it's important to get out there so we can hear from folks. So as I mentioned, we did 11 focus groups, um, total of 94 individuals participated in those in those groups. Um, 
and they identified as Black and Latinx. And you can see the geographic distribution. We had folks from across the state. Um, and Bruce, it was really great to see your symptoms up there because we had a lot of overlap in what we were hearing um, in terms of symptoms. Fatigue, um, exhaustion, um, no stamina, or, and hair loss were probably the most common symptoms we heard. In the beginning, we actually went to meet with Bruce's group because we were hearing about hair loss. Hair loss kept coming up in our groups. And we hadn't, we haven't heard about hair loss on the news. No one's talked about hair loss. Um, and, you know, in some ways you could think, is that the professionalization of long COVID? Like the symptoms that we're talking about, whose work do they impact? You know, um, some people could think like, oh, hair loss. Well, that's, you know, if you're exhausted, but depending on your job, if you're in, um, depending on the nature of your work, it, hair loss could could be could impact you. It can impact you mentally. It can impact your mental health. Um, um, and if you're if you're out on the front lines, then that could be a, a concern. And so different different professional classes will have different will be impacted differently by different symptoms. So I think that's something important for us to think about. And it's also important just to think about by gender the impact of different symptoms as well. Um, so um, certainly these were these were all the symptoms that we heard um, come out um, from the focus groups. We extracted the symptoms from the groups. Um, also, um, one of the things that we found probably our biggest finding was just the lack of awareness of long COVID and even the term long COVID. You know, I take for granted the fact that I hear about long COVID all the time because that's what I talk about at work, right? Or if you're experiencing, but folks hadn't. So picture if you're having symptoms that pro are persist over time, but you haven't heard this word long COVID and it hasn't come up for you and wondering what's going on with your body. So in nine of the 11 groups, the majority of participants had not heard of long COVID, but appreciated having the language to describe what they were experiencing. In the two English groups, those were the two groups that participants had heard um, the term long COVID, but they did feel that it was not part of the of the mainstream discourse. And I'm, I'll share with you a quote. I'll share with you quotes throughout the presentation because I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, and so this one was at, at the, a participant said at the UCB table table talk meeting, um, that was the first time I ever of ever hearing the term long COVID. I've always felt like the symptoms have happened directly after COVID, but I've never like had the language to express that. It wasn't COVID, you know, it was like a, a, an active kind of COVID, but I felt that these things I felt these things and I'd take a test and it'd be negative. And so I was relieved that there was a concept of kind of this lingering COVID. Um, another point that we heard from participants, and I know there's a lot of words on the on the slide, um, is that sometimes you think you're alone. Um, and this is similar, Jim, um, Bruce, when you um, gave your example, I thought, I thought, oh, I have a quote like that, right? I'm a gym fanatic. I've been going to the gym since my 20s and I can run a mile, like a mile or two, three miles, and I'm fine. I can't even run a half a mile now um, without having to stop. I'm like, this is not me. I mean, it blows my mind because every time I, I try, it's like I don't have, I, I don't know if it's enough oxygen or what it is, but the heaviness is hard, you know, and sometimes we're busy and we don't even even have we don't have, want to feel like this we don't we don't I'm I'm so glad I'm on this call um, you don't even know it means a lot to me because sometimes you think you're alone and you're probably the problem or you're complaining and nobody's talking about this at work um, people are going into work not feeling well and are just not well um, but you have to keep pushing we have to keep moving through and nobody has the answers about um, about anything about long COVID. And this kind of, uh, we had multiple groups where people wanted to keep having groups in terms of the support that they were getting from one another as they validated the symptoms. And so um, when you hear our recommendations, one of them we think is that there needs to be support groups available for people with long COVID. But, um, but this idea that people are still going to work, they're pressuring through, they know something's wrong in their body, but they don't also don't have the privilege to, to not go to work, right? Um, because they don't have days off, which is another theme we'll talk about. Um, so a constant tiredness. I did not I did not know the term long COVID. It seems quite appropriate because effectively one is stuck in that cycle. Um, in the case of what happened with my father-in-law, who is an elderly person, he is also diabetic, with my niece, who is a younger, much younger person. She is 20 years old without any medical condition. I noticed my father-in-law and my niece were left in this permanent fatigue. I mean, whatever they did, 
it was, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. No matter how much they slept, it doesn't matter if they took vitamins. It doesn't matter. A constant tiredness. My niece had no appetite. Um, she didn't want to eat. Any, she would always say, I didn't, I do not want to eat anything um, for more than a month and a half, which, which led her obviously to lose weight. And in the case of my father-in-law, who is diabetic, because there's, there was the issue of the insulin levels that even if he followed a strict diet, no matter how much medicine he took constantly, those levels are much higher than usual. And we heard that from participants who identified as diabetic that or were di had a um, diabetes diagnosis, they talked about not being able to manage their insulin levels um, as um, which they had managed um, pre-COVID. Um, so that was something that consistently came up as well. Um, it's like, I'm here, but I'm not here. And so this was this idea that um, a participant asked the group. I don't know if this is normal, um, but I but I did not know, I, and I don't know if it's happened to you guys, but I feel like I'm walking on air, like I'm here, but I'm not here. And suddenly I was going to do something the other day and I was going to make tortillas and I took out the sugar, I, I took a, I took out the sugar um, to make a tortilla. I, I said to myself, what is, what is wrong with me? And she was trying to take out the corn flour, but she took out the sugar and she just like her, like, couldn't focus because she was there, but she wasn't there. Um, and so um, some of our, sorry, I lost my slide for a second behind the photos. Um, so some of our um, findings were related to language barriers prevent the utilization of, of, of COVID resources. And so across all nine groups, we conducted non um, non-English languages, language was cited as a major barrier. And so, um, you know, folks didn't talk as much about immigration status. Um, they talked about language and not having resources in their language. And so this lack of accessible information online, in the news, um, there was poor translator services at healthcare facilities people talked about. And even if there were translators present um, or information was available in their language, it wasn't necessarily accessible and understandable. So um, in terms of how it was put together. So, um, this was was an example of a person said when I tested positive in 2020 I wasn't able to get a doctor I had a fever they were um, giving the example and they were always turning us away I literally had to call a translator company um, so they would explain um, what was wrong with me um, and then for the barrier was language and so not having access to interpreter services is is a barrier for folks and having available that's available information that's translated. And even when you go to um, the government website, it says some things are translatable, but then when you click on the examples, they come up in English. So um, that was something that we found even after when we started to investigate that. Um, so healthcare in many cases was perceived as unhelpful. Um, so a perceived lack of solutions versus treatments for long COVID, a sense that doctors and other healthcare, um, healthcare workers were unable to support patients experiencing long COVID symptoms. Some participants named racism as playing a role in the lack of available support. Um, participants um, who lean towards utilizing healthcare resources often cites that some, some some treatments and resources um, sharing from the hospitals or PCPs have, have been helpful. So we had, um, uh, we've had a couple participants who were able to get resources for long COVID. Um, so one example here is, yes, I, I feel it's because I was Haitian when I walked into hospitals, they automatically thought I had COVID. If it was someone from another race, I would be treated better. Um, that steers me away from wanting to go back. Um, when I, I would, what I would get to ask for help, use the Google to ask my daughter for help. So they were searching for answers in other places as opposed to going to their healthcare provider. We also heard from, from folks that it, the challenge that healthcare providers don't have the answers. And so they're explaining their symptoms and, and they're not, they're not being heard um, by their healthcare providers. So here is just some examples of some of the socioeconomic impacts that we were able to pull from the data. So one was the lack of a lack of affordable care for folks in terms of co-pays that they were accumulating. People talked about medical debt. They talked about not having sick days. And they said that this was important, not even for long COVID, but also for acute COVID, because it used to be that there was a guaranteed sick day when you had COVID, but now that doesn't exist. And so they're going to work. And so they're, they're going to work um, with acute COVID and 
with long COVID um, pain um, and, and not feeling well. They talked about long wait times for disability approval. They talked about job loss because of missed days and inability to go back. Um, they talked about the shame of being on unemployment and the stigma associated with that. They talked about medical leave and how it only covers a percent of your salary. And if you have if you if you need a full salary to pay your bills and so that's not very helpful and it just causes additional stress stress was something mental health came out across like the mental health the stress associated with not knowing what was wrong with you as well as the stress associated with the financial burden um evictions people talked about one person in a group talked about selling their car um, to support their family and so all of all of these were examples of impacts that folks talked about um, in terms of resources, we also asked, well, what's out there in terms of resources? And people talked a lot about the resources that were available during COVID, um, but less about resources that were available for not, um, for long COVID. In our English speaking groups um, with um, people who identified as Black, it was diverse Black population, they talked about um, the long COVID clinic at BMC and at Brigham. They also talked about Mass General um, pain management center for symptoms that were longer than three months. People talked about going to their clinic during, that was more during COVID, the acute phase. The ABCD, they talked about the rent support was during acute phase as well. Food delivery during the acute phase of COVID. Um, as well as the, the outreach um, was more around and vaccine campaigns, those were all around during the acute phase of COVID. The challenge that they talked about is that many of the resources that, that helps them, that they found very helpful during COVID, like um, mortgage forbearances that they were able to access, those weren't, many of those services are no longer available. And so, so that, that was a concern that people brought up. Um, and they did talk a lot about um, La Co Collaborativa and, and some of the groups um, we, they, that we had. Um, as a resource that they go to for support, a trusted resource. Um, some of the recommendations for participants um, were related to information. They, they need information about long COVID. What is it? How, uh, you know, what's common? What should they be expecting? When should they go to the doctor? Um, they could they they envisioned that information can come to them via social media sites, local news channels, some of the channels in people's languages, using a mix of online and offline avenues to share information about long COVID. They wanted to know what resources were available for help. Um, they said even, you know, flyering at events like community centers, churches, schools, getting it, just getting information into the community about what long COVID is, how it can impact people, what can be happening with them. Um, support groups so that people can learn um, about long COVID and learn and support one from one another. Um, and then more information for their doctors um, so that that doctors can support patients with long COVID because from some of the um, focus groups we were hearing that people felt um, dismissed um, oftentimes by their providers um, and that they weren't being heard by their providers or that they would go for tests, they would wait all day and then they would have to either be rescheduled or the, just the idea of having to wait all day for a series of tests when you don't have any sick days was a challenge. Um, so quickly additional um, recommendations that came up. Better, gu better guidance for employers and workplaces, reinstating paid time off for COVID, um, including the impacts of long COVID, not just for acute COVID, faster processing of long-term disability requests, revisiting requirements um, to prove disability as there is no straightforward diagnosis, um, diagnostic test for many long COVID symptoms, economic supports um, for housing payments, utilities, food, policies related to inclusive health insurance coverage to span a range of wellness options, including physical therapy, acupuncture, um, Eastern traditional medical services. We heard from people in focus groups, um, in our, it was in our English speaking focus groups where people were paying out of pocket for um, non-traditional um, forms of healing. Also, state-led incentives to encourage resource sharing between healthcare institutions. There's a huge need for um, services and only a few providers um, with long wait lists were all themes that came out. From our group, we also thought Im important um, would be for, for the state to have a clear landing page on long COVID on their on their website. And, and our group was willing to support with that. We have capacity to translate materials into multiple languages, but we need a multi a multilingual landing page resource similar to um, 
similar to what the National Health Service in English in England has a, in the UK has a very um, effective long COVID um, web page and messaging that is available and um, the the researchers and providers that are part of our core um, thought that that resource would be a great model. Um, and so that's something we're exploring, but we uh, as we can create the materials, but we can obviously um, host it. That's something that really we would we would like to see the state do. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I cut my slides by a lot, but I uh, <laughs> I'll I'll stop because we we heard I think it's important we heard from a lot of folks on how long COVID is impacting them and their families. Um, you know, family members that they're worried about who have who have kids and and are and are unable to walk up a flight of stairs or get tired folding the laundry um, and are feeling bad about the fact that they can't walk up the stairs or fold the laundry. Um, and so we just um, we think it's important that we start to really do something about this in an inclusive way. So. OK, thank you so much, um, Dr. Martinez. And I just have one. I'm, we are going to open up a panel for, for question and answer for the last 15 minutes. But uh, Linda, I just this one question came in in terms of demographics of the focus groups. Do you have information on their socioeconomic status? So I was wondering if if you didn't already say that, could you just quickly answer that one? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I don't think we have. We had a mix of people from different jobs. I don't think, Naharika, we didn't have a. So we, I don't think we collected anything on socio income or socioeconomic status. No, okay. but it was it was mixed. Um, in some of our groups, we had people who are in more professional positions and and were it, and you could hear that from as they're describing their occupation. Um, but and then some folks who are more um, service and maybe working in services or cleaning um, in schools as aides. We had people talk about that. Um, so. OK. All right. Thank you so much. So um, so. Thank you so much for those presentations. What we want to do now, um, Dr. Levy, just so everyone knows, has been answering some of the questions by typing the answers into the Q&A. So for those of us, for those of you who are, um, you know, have you been asking the questions, the answers are there in, in writing. Um, and now I would like to bring back uh, Rep. Dom, Mindy Dom. Um, and I'm going to, to do your bio so that everyone uh, is fairly uh, represented here. But Mindy Dom has served as the state representative from the third Hampshire district since 2018. She most recently served on the joint committees on the environment, natural resources, and agriculture, COVID-19 oversight, higher education, and revenue. She also served on the special committee on the Holyoke Soldiers Home for COVID-19 outbreak and on the special task force on human service transportation. So clearly Rep. Dom is is a, a key leader for us in this conversation. And so I welcome you back to be part of answering um, some of these thoughtful questions. Um, and so Dr. Levy, just bouncing back to you real quick, you had answered some of those questions about, are you seeing any patterns about you know, athleticism in long COVID or are there any sort of curative pharmaceutical answers? Could you just give a verbal answer to some of those questions if you don't mind? Sure, um, there are symptom clusters um, and those, um, are being actively studied. In fact, we're about to write, I think, our first manuscript to recover about this. Some patients have more than one of these symptom clusters. And the hope, although we don't know this yet, but that those symptom clusters will provide some information about what's underlying them. And there are many uh, theories about this that are still under scientific investigation. For example, uh, viral persistence. There's uh, evidence to suggest that some people have long-term persistent persistence of the virus and that the viral, virally produced proteins can evoke a long-term smoldering inflammatory response that people feel as fatigue and some of the other symptoms that they may have. Another line of uh, scientific inquiry is around the development of autoimmunity, an autoimmune illness related to this. Others have seen reactivation of other viruses, such as EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, or CMV. So, um, and then others um, are somewhat unexplained, I would say. So we're, there's, uh, there are symptom clusters. The hope is that underlying them 
are some definable disease driving mechanisms that would then enable precision targeting of medicinal therapy to address those mechanisms. Right now, there's no definitive um, uh, medicinal therapy for long COVID. Um, we're, fingers crossed, we'll be starting our first therapeutic clinical trial sponsored by the NIH, um, either later this month, early next month, something like that. Um, we have FDA approval and we essentially have NIH approval and we're in the final stages of all the regulatory approvals, but that'll be the first NIH sponsored clinical trial to treat long COVID. So we're really uh, still a little bit away, I think, from having a definable therapy, uh, unfortunately. There are symptom-based therapies, but not curative therapies available yet. Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you for that. And I think that that's a nice lead in to some of these other questions that were in the chat about how do you get so for your next um, study, how can you get statewide representation from folks experiencing COVID? And so I would like to ask, you know, Representative Don, when you're thinking about resources that are coming from the state and the amount of COVID we had out here um, in Western Mass, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts? about? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, my first thought is we don't have enough coming from the state around long COVID. And that uh, the state is, be, is behind in doing that. And so, um, and I think it's hard sometimes for government to not just identify what needs to get done, but prioritize what needs to get done. Um, to that end, I'm gonna be filing legislation before the end of today, because today's our deadline for filing bills on a commission to actually identify and prioritize long COVID needs. A commission that I hope will be quick and can immediately kind of produce information that then the legislature can take. But here's what I'm thinking. Um, we, I saw in the chat there were some questions around regional numbers and how do we know or don't know what's happening in Western Mass. And some of that is a regional equity issue, but some of that is a surveillance and reporting issue. So that's something government should do. There's like plenty between the two presentations, which had been extraordinary. There's plenty for government to do. And I think the first thing is we need to sort of look at what we are doing around surveillance and reporting and what needs to be done so that we're capturing more numbers so that we have a better idea of what's happening in our communities with people who are living with long COVID. Um, I found in my, my prior health education work that epidemiology is really key to engaging communities in an issue that they may think is not happening. And I think for too many people living with long COVID, they're already feeling invisible either because they don't have a diagnosis they don't have a provider who knows enough about it to talk to them about it. Their community doubts it or they question it. And so making things visible is also part of raising the temperature on it. But from what we heard today, some of the issues, and I'll just be brief about this, some of the um, activities that I think the state needs to do better on is a public information campaign, which includes the website that was talked about, professional development and continuing education for healthcare providers, that's physicians, nurses, and social workers. I'm really thinking everybody who works in the healthcare field, you know, tailored to what their role is in the healthcare field, they need to start hearing that information from their professional organization so they can start sharing it with their patients and their patients don't have to feel like they have to shop around for somebody who knows the lingo and knows the vocabulary. But the other piece that I heard is the service development piece for people living with um, long COVID. And that's, uh, you know, that's something that can happen in a big way or a small way. I tend to think we need to really task um, the state, um, potentially the Department of Public Health, with sort of leading to understand what services do folks need? What do we have? And how can we connect those two? And what do we need to sort of increase the capacity of existing services to meet the needs of people living with long COVID. Because I'm not so sure we're gonna be, um, that there's gonna be a, a, a taste or an interest in recreating new services if we just need to provide information and resources to existing ones that already have relationships with communities. So that's what I'm hearing about what the state needs to do. I really encourage people to engage with the their state legislator around this issue, please reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but I think that we need to expect more from government on long COVID. Thank you. 
Rep. Tom, one more follow up from the from the chat and from a question that came through when people registered. But what about um, employer leave for long COVID? Is that a legislative? Um, Tell me again what you said, Jesse. Employer, what? I'm sorry. When you have when you need to, you know, leave your work, have an absence yes. from work because of long COVID, yes. would that be a legislative? Absolutely. Action? And I would actually see that in um, the frame of economic security benefits for people living with long COVID. I didn't mean to overlook that. That goes for not only avoiding eviction, getting food getting transportation, getting rehab, getting someone in the home to help if you need that. But it also goes for what kind of worker employer um, laws need to be put into place so that people are getting adequate support. Um, thank you. So I just want to pick up on a um, couple of things in the chat. Maybe, um, Dr. Martinez, you could talk about this, but the stigma of having long COVID. So when you were giving the example about taking the sugar instead of something else, you know, I, I'm asking you this so that you can answer it, but how many of us have done that, you know, in our yeah. daily life, make yeah. a pumpkin pie and forget to put the sugar in. So how do you talk to people about really categorizing those types of incidences. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, part of I think part of it for folks that we talk to is just not knowing what's wrong. Like, you know, we know I, people we, we know our bodies best, right? You know, when you're not feeling well, you know, when something's wrong. And if you're consistently going to your provider and thinking something's wrong with me and, the, and, and I'm tired all the time and I don't feel I'm not feeling well and you're getting kind of well, you know, nothing back in terms of referral, you're, everything's fine, or you're getting assumptions made about you because we also have to remember kind of um, assumptions that people of color experience uh, like related to fatigue and, you know, whether it's, oh, you're just being lazy or you're not working hard enough. So I, I think that there's that piece that's then layered on top of it. And so I think part of that is making providers really aware of, you know, talking to their patients, how have you been feeling since your COVID diagnosis? Are you experiencing, you know, have you experienced any changes? Do you, you know, and just starting to have those conversations and, and, and for, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to kind of push our providers to say, no, nothing's wrong with, uh, something's wrong. Um, they should hear us. Um, so I, so I do think, um, I think that in terms of information, it's more the providers need to know how to engage. But in terms of it's it's funny because when we when we talk to folks, areas where um, they were more concerned about they're more concerned about their fa like family members just not feeling well, not do, not themselves. It wasn't as much stigma there, more so stigma they might experience from their provider. I don't know if Naharka, if you want to chime in as well. Um, on the data, but I, I think that yeah. for us, we heard more um, when you're feeling stigmatized by your provider than yeah. stigma in the community about long COVID. More so, it was there wasn't a language. There right. wasn't a language in the community around around long COVID. It wasn't, um, yeah. you know, there wasn't people weren't talking about uh, we were calling it in, in Spanish COVID prolongada. I forget the word we were using for it in Creole, but it, it, it there wasn't people were saying, oh, a COVID that persists like it's yeah. it's that's great because that's what I'm experiencing. And even in the English group, people were like, wow, you're talking about this and I've been feeling like this, but I haven't, you know, I haven't been validated a, about this can, when I go to talk to my doctor about it. Yeah. So my question then for you, Dr. Levy, is is any of these findings from your clinical work going to inform clinicians about how to interact or diagnose? Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Well, that's certainly our hope. <laughs> that's certainly our hope. And, you know, we're in this now kind of the zone where we don't have complete information. We don't have complete evidence-based information. And so this has led to a lot of the clinical practitioners who are focusing on this as centers of excellence to communicate with others, to try to learn best practices. And so uh, that's kind of where we are right now. But the whole goal here is to inform the clinical care of patients. And so that definitely is going to be a major emphasis for us going forward. There have been a couple questions about vaccine status and stuff like this and reinfection. I just want to speak to it real quickly because it's a very common question. What we are learning is that if, you're, if you are vaccinated when you get COVID, 
that there's some protection. It does decrease the risk of, of, of acquiring long COVID. It doesn't eliminate it, uh, but it does decrease the risk. You can get long COVID from a mild infection or a severe infection, and it's not predictable. Uh, and other than to say a severe infection is more likely than uh, for you to get uh, long COVID. And then if you already have long COVID and you get a vaccine, there's no apparent benefit from the vaccine itself. Um, some people get better and it's contemporaneous with the vaccine, so they may think the vaccine has helped, but larger studies have not really borne that out. And then the last thing I'll say is that there are some people with long COVID who get reinfected uh, with COVID and um, they may qualify for Paxlovid treatment. And what I've seen in probably 20, 30% of patients is when they get the Paxlovid, their long COVID symptoms go away. And if they're gone, and then a day or two after stopping the Paxlovid, they come back. And so our thought is that um, the five days, which is all that the FDA allows right now, may not be sufficient to truly clear the virus from your body. And so this is one of the reasons why we're trying to push forward for an antiviral strategy for long COVID, and hopefully we'll get that trial started very soon. Okay, well, thank you so much. And we are at our time. So Kelly has put the survey in the chat. If those of you who are still with us can fill that out, I wanna say thank you so much. And I also wanna say to our colleagues at the Men of Color Health Awareness, I see your questions in the chat. We will get you uh, one pagers or information um, for sure. We'll follow up with you with information that you can take out into the community as this is so very, very important. So I want to thank you all, Dr. Levy, Dr. Martinez, Rep. Dom, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, this will be recorded and put on the website for dissemination. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.